and welcome to this time of worship for Sunday, March 7th, 2021. Let's take just a moment to let that sink in. March. March 7th. I don't know about you, but for me, it's been about a year since dates or times seem to make any kind of sense. But the calendar assures me that this is March 7th, and it is the third Sunday in Lent, so we'll go with that. I'm Regberg, and I'm the pastor at Prince of Faith Lutheran Church in Calgary, Alberta. Just a moment ago, I used the word welcome. And I want to say it again because I want to make sure you're taking me seriously. Too often, people use the word welcome, but it comes with certain conditions. You're welcome to be here, but only if you act a certain way or change certain things. Or you're welcome to be here, but you're not allowed to participate in this or that aspect of our time together. Now, it's unfortunately true that there are situations in which we may run into this kind of conditional welcome, but this isn't one of them. When I say that you are welcome, I mean that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts, just a period. You are welcome, period. That means that you're welcome to participate in this time to as great or as small an extent as you want to. You're welcome to simply listen or to join in the spoken responses or to sing along with the songs or hum or, heck, turn down the volume if you want to. You're welcome to engage with me in the message, which... To be fair, would work better in person, but such is life right now. You're welcome to join in the prayers if you want to, or add your own prayers. And you're welcome to share in Holy Communion later. You're also welcome to choose not to participate. In any case, I'm glad that you're here. There's one other thing that you're welcome to do, that we are welcome to do. And for me, it's a relief to know this. We're welcome to come intentionally into God's presence just as we are. And we're welcome to be real, to be honest, and to come clean, both with God and with ourselves, and admit that we've made a mess of things. And we've hurt ourselves, we've hurt others. In the process, we've even hurt our relationship with God again. And yet, we're welcome to come again and confess again that we have blown it, knowing that as we do, we will also hear again God's word of forgiveness spoken to us. And so, as we begin this time today, I invite you to join me in a time of both confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Amen. If you were to keep watch over our sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so we confess. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits, that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. And receive this good news. Though you have turned away from God, still God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sin is forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. Our gathering song today, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today from the Bible is one that is likely very familiar, and yet I think we so often miss the point of it. The Ten Commandments. How often do we hear these as simply a list of don'ts? Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this other thing. But do we ever stop to consider the question of why? Let me give you a hint. It's all about relationships, healthy relationships. If you want to have a healthy relationship with God, don't what? Don't go chasing after other gods? That'd be a good start. If you want to have a healthy relationship with other people, well, don't kill them. Duh. Don't steal from them. Don't go around spreading lies about them. Really, it's pretty basic stuff. So let's listen, maybe from a fresh perspective, to these verses from the book of Exodus. Our first reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even the children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. <clears throat> Remember to observe the, sab the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest de dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's join together in reading Psalm 19, and we'll read it responsively. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete, eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. 
How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our second reading today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O And our gospel reading for today is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the, te- in the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, What are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. 
All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? they exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Our Gospel lesson for today that passage we just heard, is one that we might not be sure quite what to do with. Let me set the stage for you, give you the context. In John's account of Jesus' life and ministry, the first chapter is devoted really to introducing us to Jesus, or as John refers to him, the Word. The Word who became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's how it's put in the message. Another translation of the Bible puts it this way. The Word became human and made his home among us. Different wording. Same idea. God entered into our human reality in Jesus and made his home among us. After Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River, he calls a few people to follow him, to become his disciples. He invites them to, to go where he goes, to learn from him, even to share in the things that he's doing. And yet at this point, Jesus is still very much in the shadows. Nothing has happened so far that would shine a spotlight on him. Chapter 2 of John's Gospel begins with Jesus taking these new disciples with him to a village called Cana. Why did he go there? Well, because there was a wedding, and he and his disciples had been invited to come. Now, you may have heard what happens while he's there. As the reception is going on, there's an emergency. At least it would have been a social emergency for the bride and groom. They've run out of wine for their wedding guests. I mean, the bar just closed, and the guests are getting cranky. Now, Jesus isn't the only one who's been invited to this wedding. His mother is there too. And when she learns about this potential embarrassment, she intervenes and basically tells Jesus, you do something about it. His initial response? According to John, Jesus tells her, is that any of our business, mother, yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. And his mom, well, she simply goes ahead and tells the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And even Jesus knows you don't argue with mama. And so John records the first miracle that Jesus did, turning water into wine. In fact, the best wine. Still, no one there knew what had happened apart from the servants who had filled the water jugs as Jesus had asked them to do, and who then took some of what they dipped out back to the master of ceremonies. There was nothing to really catch anyone's attention, either the general public's attention or the religious leader's attention. There's still no spotlight shining on Jesus. But that's about to change. After this wedding, Jesus heads south and he goes to Jerusalem. It's almost time for the annual Passover celebration. And like every devout Jew, he wants to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. To this day, in fact, Passover celebrations around the world end with the expressed hope next year in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It had long been regarded as, as the heart of the Jewish faith, as Jerusalem was where the temple was. The temple, first built by King Solomon and completed around 957 BCE. The temple, destroyed by the Babylonian army around 587 BCE. And then about 70 years later, after the Jewish people returned from exile in Babylon, the temple was rebuilt and it stood until 70 CE when it was destroyed by the Romans. It was here at the temple where the priests would offer sacrifices. It was to the temple where people would come on a pilgrimage. It was in the temple where the Holy of Holies was to be found, the most sacred space in Judaism in which it was believed that the very presence of God dwelled. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned sacrifices. 
This was, in fact, the central aspect of worship in the temple. The people were to come and bring their sacrifices, and the priests would then offer these to God. The Hebrew Scriptures, what we often call the Old Testament, lay out very clear and precise rules regarding this. The people were to offer as sacrifice the best of what they had. They were to take the best from their flocks, or at other times of the year, the best of their crops, etc., etc., all of which God had given them, and give this portion back to God. But the religious leaders had changed things. A person could now go to the temple and buy the cattle or the sheep or the doves and offer these as sacrifice. It no longer came from their best. It was no longer a personal sacrifice. Their sacrifice no longer had to have any real personal impact apart from laying out some cash. Their sacrifice no longer came from the best of what God had given them. Instead, convenience became the norm. On top of that, You can bet these animals weren't being sold at fair market value. I mean, here we really get a glimpse of of an early form of capitalism. There were profits that could be made. Well, that explains the sheep, the cattle, and the doves that John tells us about. But John also mentions the money changers. What was this all about? Well, the money changers that were in the temple also had a very specific role to play. You see, everyone coming in was required to pay a temple tax, kind of like paying admission to come into church. But remember, at this time, Judea was under Roman control and hence used Roman currency. But this Roman currency couldn't be used to pay the temple tax. So, for a price, people could exchange their Roman coins for Jewish coins, allowing them to pay the temple tax. It also held true for those who had made the pilgrimage to come to Jerusalem. They could exchange their foreign currency for the Jewish coins needed to pay this tax. Now, in effect, by allowing these things to happen, the religious leaders had exchanged true worship for a system of supply and demand and, of course, profit. Religion, worship, was no longer about relationship with God. It had become little more than a business transaction. And so when Jesus walks into the temple and sees this, he's not impressed. Here's what we read. In the temple area, Jesus saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. What was intended to foster or nurture relationship with God had instead become an impersonal business transaction and one that I suspect took advantage of people as well. And Jesus sets about remedying the situation. Now, this might not seem like the Jesus we imagine. You know, the the nice guy Jesus. The calm, unflappable, serene Jesus we so often see in pictures. But what we see here, unmistakably, is his passion. Not his passion for a building, though. But his passion for the relationship between God and God's people. And yet, when the religious leaders challenge him to show them a sign to prove he has the authority to do these things, we can see that Jesus' concern is not so much about the building. Listen again to this part of our reading. What are you doing, they demanded. If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What, they replied. It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. A little bit of foreshadowing there. A couple of chapters later in John's Gospel, in chapter 4, a Samaritan woman will ask Jesus about where the correct place is to worship God. Here's a little bit of that exchange. She asks him, Why is it 
that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it's here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. The time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I think that's an important message for us to remember today, too. We, too, need to wrestle with the question of what's most important, the physical place in which we gather for worship, or that in worship, the relationship God wants to have with us can be nurtured. Next Sunday will mark the one-year anniversary of our gathering for worship not in a certain building, not at the same time, in the same place, but gathering perhaps at different times, gathering in our homes or in our cars or at the office or out at the lake, whenever and wherever we may have been. Gathering to worship online. This change wasn't one that we went looking for, but rather it was forced on us because of this pandemic. But maybe, just maybe, it's been a gift to us as well. All of our lives, when we've thought of church, or even when we've thought of worship, I suspect that we've connected this thought with a specific building. Yes? We'll talk about going to church. Well, there's the building, right? Or we'll talk about things that the church is doing, or could do, or is called to do, and it all connects in some way to the building, doesn't it? We've forgotten that the church, as it's referred to in the Bible, is not about a building. Buildings are nice, don't get me wrong, especially when it's 40 below. The building is nice, but it's not essential. The church is a community of faith, a community of people who have been called out. The Greek word that we find in the Bible, the word ekklesia, is usually translated church, but it literally means those who are called out called out from the usual things of this world, called out from the accepted, common, even normal ways of being and thinking and doing, called out to be different, to be a contrast people, a people who live their lives differently because of their faith in Jesus. We've had the opportunity over this past year to begin to realize that even though we're not gathering together in a specific building at this time, we are still the church. We are those whom God has called to follow, called together, and called out so that we can be nurtured in faith and equipped and empowered in Jesus' name and who are then sent back into the world around us to share God's love and grace and forgiveness. That's what it means to be church. There are, however, some in our society, in our province even, who insist that they cannot be the church unless they're in a certain building. And they're screaming that they're being persecuted because they're being told to scale it back and take care of people. One pastor, and I'm picturing quotation marks around that word, one pastor has been in jail because he refused to abide by public health measures claiming that he had to obey God, not the government. Today I want to share a letter with you from our bishop, a letter that addresses this. This was written on February 24th. Dear beloved of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. During this time of continued restrictions in response to public health concerns regarding the ongoing COVID pandemic, we again enter the season of Lent, a time of waiting, pondering, and reflection. We slow down. We refrain. We anticipate resurrection. These past 11 months have been trying at best. They too have been a time of waiting, pondering, and reflection. We still have a long way to go before our social interactions at church and in our wider communities can fully resume as we so dearly desire. I'm confident that the Holy Spirit, who has sustained us these difficult months, will uphold and lead us through the duration of the pandemic, 
thank you for your sacrifice, your persistence, and your loving care for those you are called to serve. I'm deeply grateful to the rostered and lay leaders of our synod for your diligent protection of our communities and congregations in refraining from in-person worship, as I have repeatedly recommended, by utilizing means of worship and congregational life not reliant on in-person gatherings, and by adhering to the guidelines set forth by Alberta Health Services and our Chief Medical Officer of Health, you are acting in love to protect both the members of your congregation and the communities in which they live, study, and work. Recently, as many of you know, Rev. James Coates of Grace Life Church Spruce Grove was arrested after repeated violations of public health directives, including refusal to maintain social distancing at worship services, wear masks, and limit the number of attendees as directed in the provincial mandate. On their website, Rev. Coates and his congregation urge churches to disregard public health directives and encourage Albertans to resume social interaction around meals in defiance of provincial guidelines aimed at preventing the spread of COVID-19. Protests in support of Rev. Coates and against public health measures took place in Edmonton over the weekend. I am sorely disappointed, frustrated, and concerned when I hear of those who have chosen to openly defy the good work, advice, and directives of Alberta's public health officials. As Christians, the call to love others is inseparable from our call to love and serve our God. The protection of our neighbors from COVID-19 is itself an act of worship in that so doing honors and glorifies God by the offerings of mercy and compassion Conversely, actions that endanger others are not compatible with either the worship of God or our confession of faith in Christ. During this pandemic, which imposes restrictions, echoing practices common during the season of Lent, let us show mercy and compassion. Let us refrain. Let us anticipate resurrection. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Christ, Shalom. Bishop Larry Kokendorfer. That day in the temple, Jesus found himself stepping into the spotlight. Not because he defied restrictions that were there to protect people, but because he took a stand against those things that shifted the focus away from true worship. Because he dared by his actions to point to the relationship God wanted to have with God's people rather than the accepted conveniences of doing things in what had become the usual way. Can we do the same In some way, even some small way, can we take a stand, not against restrictions or against public health concerns, but instead take a stand for living out our faith in Jesus in the real world in which we are living day by day? Can we live our lives as those whom God has called to follow, called together, called out so that we can be nurtured in faith and equipped and empowered in Jesus' name and who are then sent back into the world around us to share God's love and grace and forgiveness. I believe that we can. And I pray that by God's grace, we will indeed be the church. Amen. Shall my name be blessed? Could the world be 
Wipe away all tears for the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. Though I am small, my God, my all, you worked great things in me, and your mercy will last from the depths of the past to the end of the age to be. This tears every tyrant from his throne. The hungry poor shall weep no more for the food they can never earn. There are tables spread, every mouth be fed, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. Rage from age to age, we remember who holds us fast. God's mercy must deliver us from the conqueror's rushing grasp. This saving word that our forebears heard is the promise which holds us bound. Till the spear and rod can be crushed by God, who is turning the world around. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. God has made us God's own beloved people through our baptism into Christ Jesus. As we live together in trust and in hope, let's join together in a confession of faith as we say, We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And as God's people gathered in Jesus' name, gathered around God's word, let's join together in prayer. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Praying, hear us, O God, and responding, your mercy is great. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing besides you. Your name is holy. Guide your church, that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement 
to protect the well-being and vo freedom of all, especially those most vulnerable and most often overlooked. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves in all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A few minutes ago in the message, I spoke of the intention of the sacrifices offered in the temple in what we might call Old Testament times. This was intended to foster the relationship between God and people as it gave people a chance to, to both recognize that all that they had was a gift from God and to respond to that gift. In that part of our worship services where we receive an offering, it's really very similar. We too have the opportunity to recognize that all that we have is a gift from God and we have the opportunity to give back in thanksgiving. And at the same time, we share in the work, the mission that God is doing through God's church. So as we ponder today both God's goodness and how we can respond, let's join together in an offertory prayer. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal, that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In a moment, we're going to have another opportunity to share in a gift given to us by God. That's the gift of Holy Communion. On the surface, it looks like a pretty simple thing. Words are spoken, prayers are said, and we share in a bit of bread and a sip of juice or wine. But that's only what we see on the surface. Like so many things in life, though, the significance of this gift lies below what we can see on the surface. Consider the amazing processes taking place as a person reflects on something or spends time with memories of past experiences of even the amazing work that things like your heart and your lungs or other organs are doing. We can't see these things on the surface either, but without them, life as we know it wouldn't happen. It's true that on the surface, Holy Communion doesn't look like much, but contained within this gift, hidden in, with, and under the bread, of, bread and wine, our Lord Jesus comes to us and offers us the gift of life in him, and offers us sustenance for our journey through life. If you want to share in this gift of Holy Communion today, there are a couple of things I want to invite you to do. The first is to remember what I said at the beginning of this time of worship, what I said about you being welcome, period. And the second thing is to invite you to hit pause and get a couple of things ready. A bit of bread or a bun, or even a cracker, a small glass of, of juice or wine. Exactly what the stuff is that we share isn't critical. What matters, what makes the difference, is that we're sharing this gift at Jesus' invitation and that he is here with us. So if you want to share in Holy Communion today, just hit pause, grab these couple of things, then hit play again and we'll continue. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy 
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn as we say together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O God, creator of heaven and earth. You rescued your covenant people, led them on their journeys, and taught them by the prophets. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in this meal and make us one in this community of faith and with your people throughout the world. Glory and praise to you, O God, author of life, word made flesh, power of the Most High, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so take and eat the body of Christ given for you. and the body of Christ given for me. And take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. And the blood of Christ shed for me. And in this simple, simple sharing, the most amazing thing has happened. In the bread and wine of Holy Communion, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has himself come to you. And he does forgive you all your sins. And he empowers you to go in his name. To share his amazing love and grace wherever you go to be his church in our world. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in God's grace. Amen. Let's pray together. O God, in this holy communion, you have welcomed us into your presence, nourished us with words of mercy, and fed us at your table. Amid the cares of this life, strengthen us to love you with all our heart, serve our neighbors with a willing spirit, and honor the earth you have made. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And receive this word of benediction. 
You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Well, I just want to make one quick announcement today, and that's to remind you that throughout the season of Lent, we're getting together via Zoom to explore Paul's letter to the Galatians in the Bible. If you're already on my radar, either because you've joined in the study we shared before Christmas or joined in the last couple of Monday evenings, I'll be sending you the Zoom link. If you aren't able to join us, or if you aren't interested, just ignore the email. No harm, no foul. But if you didn't receive an email last week and you'd like to join in, please send me an email. Just send a note to pastor at princeoffaith.ca. That Bible study continues for the next four Mondays, starting at 7 o'clock in the evening. Our closing song today, the hymn, Lord, Take My Hand and Lead Me.
So go in peace. Share the good news. We will. Thanks be to God. Amen.